All right, so we are now at the point where we can measure our piston protrusion. Our piston protrusion uh, test is measuring the distance from the top of this piston to the block here. And what we're going to do is get a reading on how far above the deck we are with the pistons at top dead center. In order to determine top dead center, uh, this is the way I'm going to do it anyways. I'm going to place my dial indicator on the piston and then I'm going to lock my magnet in and I'm going to turn the engine over. On the dial, I'm looking for the top dead center. So we can see here we're at about 56 thousandth. If we turn the engine over, it's going to mess with our reading. So we've actually gone back down now. We'll come back and we'll go to what I think is top dead center. We stopped at about 60, I saw. It's right there at 60. So we're aiming for that 60 if we can. We wanna be as precise as possible. We'll call that top dead center. Real close to 60, so say 59 thousandth. So let's go to 59 thousandth. Slip back a little bit, right about there. That's where we wanna be. So we know that we're at top dead center for cylinders three and four. We're just going to move our dial indicator off of this piston here, and we're going to measure how many thousandth of an inch we get. So let's zero out our scale just for sake of clarity or even adding indicator here. Let me get in a better spot. We want this spot to be as close to the edge as we can. And we also want it to be right in the middle where it says front. Cause what this is going to do is the piston is going to jostle. Let's say left to right. If we're looking forward and back, it's going to jostle left to right on the compression and power stroke. The piston is going to jostle like this. So we want to get the most accurate reading front to center. And by doing that right here, we'll be able to get that measurement. Let's go ahead and zero out our dial indicator. So again, we can see we're zeroed out and then we'll slide it off the piston onto the deck. And from here we have a subtraction of about 25 thousandth. And that's about right within spec where our spec is actually 24 to 28 thousandth for these particular pistons. So that means we are within spec on this cylinder. We'll go ahead and check the back and the rest of the cylinders and make sure that everything's up to par. And then we'll confirm and reference with our piston numbers, part numbers, and then continue assembly. Now we're gonna be getting into our head. Now this head has a couple cracks in the injector porch, which I'll show you in a second here. But for right now, what we're doing is taking a valve screen compressor and we're pushing up against the face of the valve, or not the face, the whatever the part of the valve this is, and the valve spring with this valve spring compressor. This would be a good time to use protective eyewear. Again, I don't know where mine's at. We're just trying to get this Tight enough to where we can get the keepers out. And there they go, one went flying, so I'm gonna go find that. So what happened there was my spring compressor tool wasn't seated correctly on the retainer and these little keepers, at least one of them anyways, shot off. So here's the keeper, here's the other one. I found it, luckily, so we'll take a little more precaution with the next one, but we can go ahead and start loosening this valve spring compressor gently and that'll give us our retainer and our valve spring. Again, good opportunity to utilize your protective eyewear. Whenever you're compressing springs, it can always be a somewhat risky endeavor. Eventually this will just loosen up enough to where our retainer is going to fall out and give us access to our valve. All right. That'll be loose enough. We can at least take our spring compressor out, take our retainer and our valve spring out. We'll keep these all in the same positions. You can see here, this is a valve spring valve stem. Here's our valve stem seal. We're gonna replace all those because they came in the kit. It's a good opportunity to do this whenever you're into your head. And here we can see the back of the valve. This one's in pretty gnarly shape. We're gonna have to clean this up. Um, this would be a good opportunity to lap your valves and or to have them machined and make sure that everything seals correctly. The face of the valve is not in great condition. We might look at lap lapping these by hand, which I wouldn't recommend uh, doing at home, but uh, this is a budget build. So we're gonna see if we can't make this work. For whatever reason, I chose to do the valve spring removal in kind of an unconventional position, uh, standing straight up. 
get two blocks of wood and just do it on a bench. It'll make it a lot easier. You can see me here using a magnet to remove the keepers from the little window in the valve spring compressor, but it'd be much easier to just do this standing straight up. Sometimes you just get into a rhythm of doing things and it makes sense in the moment, but looking back, I know that you know this is not the right way to do it and actually made it pretty difficult to maneuver the keepers in and out. And uh, yeah, just put it on a bench with a couple blocks of wood because you're gonna need some clearance on the bottom side. They make all sorts of valve spring compressor tools. This is just a conventional Harbor Freight one and I've used it on several heads and it works and I've got it down to kind of a rhythm. So use whatever one you'd like. You can even rent one from AutoZone, then you don't even have to buy it. If you're planning on going past 3500 RPM, this would be the opportune moment to also install your 62 pound valve springs. Again, this is gonna be a stock rebuild, so no need to go crazy with it. The old valve stem seals actually look pretty good, but you can see me removing them here just because sometimes they're more brittle than you think they are, and we've got a whole brand new set that came with the kit, so we should use those. I'm also using a valve stem seal puller. It's a specialty tool. Again, I think you can get it at Harbor Freight. And then installing them, you just push them in with your thumb, and I used a brass hammer to gently tap them in, making sure they're seated all the way. And here's the first look at the uh, valve train or the valve seats. I can see a little bit of pitting and galling, but nothing to worry about. I'm not going to have this sent to the machine shop for a three angle valve job and all the bells and whistles. We're just going to perform a leak down test essentially on it and see that everything holds, not pressure, but holds some oil. We're going to put some oil on top of the valves once they're all put back in. And I'd say this would probably be the most tedious part of the whole process of installing the valve train is you know, making sure you use some assembly lube to put it in and then just trying to get the keepers in with this valve spring tool was not easy. Uh, again, you want to have it sitting upright if possible. I didn't, so I had to finagle it. So we've got all of our valves put back into the head, new valve stem seals, and we're going to just run this head. Some people might call it a junk head because of the cracks. From all the research that I've done, I've seen that a lot of these nine millimeter or non-intercooled early model heads have cracks and they're pretty common. The question is, are they too big in order to run them? Are they into the valve seats? And this one, upon inspection, doesn't look like it. Let me explain why I wanna use this head and not go for a different one. Even though we're spending quite a bit of money on this whole build, what with the rebuild kit and the deck and the hone and the overbore and all that, we do want to try and save some money. I'm not made out of money. Unlike some bigger YouTube channels, uh, this is all just funded by my job, so. This is a nine millimeter injector, and these came in the non-intercooled versions. These injectors, the nozzles are too big for a remanufactured head. They only make these heads in seven millimeter holes. So, the issue is, if I buy a new head from a machine shop, then I have to get new injectors. So now I've got a new head, I'm in for $1,000 plus, and then injectors are another $600. We're looking at like $2,000 if we wanna do a new head and new injectors. So it's not really worth it in my opinion. I think I can run this and I'll be fine. From people I've consulted, I think I'll be good. What we've done is we put oil in all of the valve surface areas on top of the head of the valve and we've let it sit overnight and we don't have any leakage, so that's good. Now, we're going to send the head off to be decked, and they're probably going to grimace when they see the cracks. I'll tell them, doesn't need to be magnet dusted. I've already checked the head, and we know that there's a few cracks in the injector port. So, we're just going to send this off to get decked, pay a couple hundred bucks, slap it on with the head gasket, and call it a day. This build is not going to get sold like the previous one. This is going in my personal 80 series. So if it does blow up, I don't feel bad about it. We'll just rip it out and put a new one in. That having been said, we're gonna continue with assembly. We're gonna move on to our oil cooler and put the right gaskets in this. This is a brand new oil cooler that came with the kit from Interstate McBee. So a lot of times these fins can get clogged up and they suggest using a new one. So that's what we're gonna do. So I'm gonna get a couple bolts put in preemptively. So we'll go one, and we'll go to the opposite side. Okay, so we've got two on opposite sides going, and now we'll go ahead and put in the rest. You'll notice that the oil filter housing is not stripped and painted. It's because I'm going for that vintage look, and uh, I'll be honest, I'm just being lazy. And these are just a bunch of 10 millimeters. We'll go ahead and hit these with our right angle impact trying to go in a star pattern as much as possible. And we're just snugging these up. We're not torquing these down to anything. 
I really do recommend getting one of these right angle ratchets from Harbor Freight. They make life a breeze. These should all be torqued down to 18 foot pounds. Now our oil cooler is installed. This is where your oil filter will go. It'll screw on here. This is a block port, but we're gonna retain the 80 series Land Cruiser oil pressure sending unit or the bung off of the oil filter housing for the 80 series. And this will be the feed line for the turbo. We're also going to take this chance to install our oil pump. So I'm just putting some assembly lube on the forward facing side of the uh, oil pump itself, just cause this will be sitting for a while. We're gonna make sure that everything's lubricated. And we'll torque these to 18 foot pounds. Comment down below if these are supposed to be Loctited. So we're not gonna be using the turbo that came with this engine. It was a non-intercooled turbo that just goes straight to the intake with a charge pipe. We have picked up this HX35 turbo. This is off a 24 valve Cummins, and this is going to make a lot more power. It moves a lot more air. You can see the passage through the compressor is quite a bit more robust. I don't have the old one because I sold it to compare it to, but yeah, this is going to be a lot better option for this build. It is possible to run it. You have to run different AN fitting lines going to your oil filter housing, but yeah, we're gonna go ahead and run this. This is externally waste gated, uh, but we do have an issue where the previous owner just kind of lopped off all of the studs. So we're gonna have to use some sort of a torch or weld nuts onto the back of this and figure out a solution as far as mounting this on the stock manifold, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. So we're actually going to be using the stock AC alternator bracket that came with this Dodge. It's old, it's crusty. We've got some cleaning to do on this and uh, this is actually going to work. One of my friends completed a swap using the stock AC bracket and we're gonna try and make it work. We might have to go with the accessory mount that we got from Dustin last time, but we have seen proof of concept that these do work and I believe you have to delete your rear heater, but we did that on the last one and I'm not too worried about it. So this is your water outlet, which will come from your thermostat housing, I believe on the side of the block. And then this will be the uh, return line going back to the uh, heater valve metrics that's up on the uh, dash or the cowl of the 80 series Land Cruiser. I'm about to load the cylinder head into the back of the Corolla and take it up to the machine shop in Sandpoint. I'm sure they'll have it done sometime next week. And then we can continue installation of the head once it's decked. These are power driven diesel head bolts and these are grade 12. They're much stronger than the regular Cummins head bolts and we didn't even have a full set so we had to get them anyways. I did also order this uh, hex socket. This is supposed to be stronger than the ones you can get let's say at Harbor Freight or that I have in my mechanics tool set. So we'll be installing these next week and torquing them down with a head gasket, checking all of our clearances and then probably looking at the injection pump, timing, and tap it cover all the little bits. We do have to figure out a way to get this engine off so we can do the rear main seal and then do the oil pan. And then it's pretty much assembled. So exciting stuff. We also have the adapter kit coming from Dustin with the main shaft that's splined down to 19 so we can dig into our transmission sometime next week. That's about all I have for you this week. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below and thanks for watching.